Welcome everybody to the Safina Society Nothing But Facts live stream. And on a day, on a Tuesday midday, it's one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Um, the winter is setting in, it's getting really cold out. And on a day which will be the last time that we do Shema'el on Tuesdays. Shema'el will be more appropriately shifted to Mondays because that is a time when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born and anything related to the Messenger, peace be upon him, makes much more sense to do that on a Monday. So this will be the last time we do Shema'il on Tuesday. We'll from now on be doing it on Monday and we'll do the Qur'an on Tuesday. I had ordered it as Qur'an then Shema'il, right? That made sense from that aspect. But then if you look at all the books, anytime that they do anything related to the messenger, they do it on a Monday because the Prophet's words, I was born on a Monday. We're continuous reading from his sayings on the humility of his life. How humble was the life and the way of living of Sayyid al-Kawnayn alayhi salatu wasalam. I have been threatened in the path at a time when no one else was threatened. I have been harassed so much that no other person had experienced such harassment. I experienced 30 such nights and days wherein I and Bilal radiallahu anhu did not possess a thing which a living creature could possibly eat except for the little that was hidden under the arm of Bilal. This incident... As authored, uh, the author has mentioned in his jama, took place out when going out of Mecca al mukarrama one day. This was not at the time of the Hijra, okay, since Bilal did not accompany the Prophet in the Hijra. This refers to a different trip they took outside of Mecca al mukarrama Okay. The meaning that I had been threatened is mean refers to the very early time when the only few followers he had was Sayyidina Khadija, Sayyidina Ali from his household. From outside of his household, his best friend, the nobleman of Mecca, Abu Bakr, and the one who would become his very close Sahabi, who was a nobleman from Habasha, ended up through wars becoming a slave in Mecca. So he was in the lowest rung of people in Mecca, However, his character was not uh, representative of what we would call low-class type of people. He was somebody who was actually a prince from a princely... Prince meaning like he's from a princely family, from a, a, a wealthy, educated family in uh, Al-Habasha. So that is Sayyidina Bilal. Many people don't know that, but he was a prince. Like his family was from the ruling class of Habasha. He was uh, not just some low-class slave or something like that that people could imagine you know uh, that aspect from him well uh he was troubled he was mu- troubled meaning they had attacked uh, uh the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and there was no one to defend him Sayyidina abu Bakr was not all around all the time Sayyidina ali was a young boy Sayyidina khadija was a woman that does not go into scuffles and Sayyidina bilal was stuck with his master Sayyidina bilal it was a while before he got his freedom. And so the Prophet faced all of these things all alone, all by himself. Okay? And that is something that the Prophet is remembering. Uh, why would the Prophet say that? Why would he remember that? Perhaps, and Allah knows best, this, the siyaq or the context is not here. But it could simply be out of speaking about the blessing of Allah that he was made now in safety. Now he has many followers. Allah blessed him and brought forth his promise. Allah's promise is always being brought forth. And anytime that Allah has a promise in the Quran, you should take it up. Meaning, Sayyidina Ali said this, meaning that it is a reflection of Iman. It, we, if, Allah makes, if I make a promise, a human makes a promise, we may say, oh, you never know. Right? You, you may... I promise you I'm going to give you $10,000. I'll support you when you go to medical school. I'll help you rent your apartment and get your car and all that stuff. All right, five years later, I don't know if your state is the same. You may have lost money. Maybe your wife is against me now for some reason. I said something. Maybe you're going to turn back on your word. That's the state of human beings. So you don't trust 
human beings, that's fine. It's understandable that you don't trust human beings. But Allah and his messenger are to be trusted. That's why Sayyidina Ali said, when Allah makes a promise, take him up on the promise. Say, oh Allah, you said if we say this, we'll be freed. If we do this, we'll receive this. The only question is, have I said it enough and properly? This is not rocket science. إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنَعَانِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِي Salah will br- a barrier between fahsha, lewd, filthy sins. That's what fahsha means. Sexual sins. Some people are addicted to various sexual sins. Al-munkar is uh, false beliefs, like odd things, things nobody said before. In aqidah or in fiqh, in behavior of some sort. This is al-munkar. And some people also, they have a tendency to fall into those things. They may be sucked into a, a new idea that's a bid'ah in our religion. A bid'ah, it contradicts the purposes and it contradicts the example of the Prophet and the Sharia. Walbaghi, having this rebellious attitude. So let's say I'm a youth and I got the, some one of these issues. I say, okay, Allah said that salah is a barrier. So I won't have to fight those things. Salah will fight those things for me. Some youth says, man, I can't get off these sins. You don't have to. Salah will get you off. You can't. You're right. No human being can resist some of the temptations on today. That's my belief. No, Very few human beings can by themselves resist it. So we say, most of us will fall in the category of there's no resisting this as a human being. But Allah did not tell you to resist it. He told you, Salah will stop you. Imagine, I can't protect my house from all the criminals, but I'll put a lock. I'll get security. The police will come. I'll hire security. Likewise, inna salata tanha'an al-fahsha. You, ha- you can't resist? Don't have to resist. Bring Salah. Salah will stop it for you. Now, I pray five times a day. I pray a couple sunnahs here and there, but I still fall into these sins. What do we tell you? Your Salah isn't strong enough. You need more. Do you pray to Hajjud? Do you pray it every single day? Is your, are you, is your just your body moving or is your heart also moving in Salah? So is, are you doing it correctly? Doing it correctly, it takes you 25 minutes. The resources are everywhere in any madhab. How do I do per- correct wudu, correct salah? It takes you, should not take you more than one hour to study this. Obligations of salah are 19, sunnah so al-akad are 8. Obligations of wudu are 7. Things that cause you to lose wudu are what? 6? It's not rocket science. 16? If you, if you separate, did you get 16 by se- separating the different things of loss of consciousness, for example? Yeah, because loss of consciousness causes you to lose your wudu. But which loss of consciousness? There's sleep, there's many different losses of consciousness. It takes you 25 minutes to learn this stuff. But the sincerity in it is what, what needs work. The amount, which what does that need? Stamina and motivation. So the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is true. And that may be the reason why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioning this out of tahadduth bin ni'mah speaking about the ni'mah it's always good to look back and say we didn't have all this now we have all this it's a good thing to do that we we never used to be able to do this we do now we have all this right we were ignorant now we all mashallah we learn stuff we were upon sins now we're, we're, we're better off we used to be poor alhamdulillah now we have something so uh, that is the tahadduth bin ni'mah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet never liked complaining. Listen to this. Khabbab ibn al-Arat. And you should know who was Khabbab ibn al-Arat. Major, major, major sahabi. Okay. He was one of the early Muslims. And he came to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there were the marks of burns on his back. He used to work for me- with metal. He was a very poor man who worked for a woman. She, he was working the metal work for her. She would come in and take like a stick or something, put it in the fire, get it hot, and then sting him with it if she saw him praying. 
he came to the messenger with these wounds. And he said, Messenger of Allah, when is the victory of Allah coming? And the Prophet ﷺ saw in him this lack of sabr and this type of complaining. And the Prophet grew angry. Uh, you can't imagine. There's a man, he believes in you. There's not a many people who believe in you. He's being burnt. That's how badly he's being tortured. Yet, the Prophet ﷺ saw that this characteristic will nullify all of your iman. That's why he became upset with it. He became upset because this complaining characteristic, it will nullify, eventually, it will eat away at your iman. It'll break it. You become this hopeless person who does, has no uh, uh, strength of faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet grew angry. And he said, there used to be a people, when they believed, they would be taken and their bodies would be sawed from the head to men. One man holding a saw on this side, one man holding the saw on the other side. Go over his head, and they would saw at his brain and split his body into two parts. SubhanAllah. This just goes to show how this yasi, yes means despair, a yes attitude. The Prophet did not have any tolerance because there is a lack of iman there. No yes. No desperation. No speaking of the negative like this. And having khalas, when is it going to be over? No. Have sabr. The Prophet ﷺ said, لَكِنَّكُمْ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ okay? So what did the Prophet say when a person fell into this complainy mentality? And it's permitted for to say this because the Sahaba, when they entered Islam, they did not like a light switch become perfect. They still made mistakes and the Prophet taught them and that's why we're allowed to mention that. The Prophet ﷺ visualized in their minds something 10 times worse as a way, because it's all relative. Everything's relative. Everything when it comes to ben comfort and discomfort is relative. So you only pull out the worst discomforts when a person is in this complaining mood. You're in a complaining mood. Your situation could be far worse. Wake up. In other circumstances, there was a Sahabi, Uthman ibn Mad'un. A poet came, and this poet was a non-Muslim. And all the kuffar, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, they were all there. And Uthman ibn Mad'un went. And then he says, Everything besides Allah is batil. Meaning it's going to fade away. He said, Bal, Naimul Jannah Baqi. No, the, the, the blessing of Jannah is forever, everlasting, right? So they beat him up. They beat him up. And he came back happy. He was happy. He was, it was for him an honor to get beat up for the sake of saying the truth. What did the Prophet say to him? The exact opposite. He said, Wallah, you didn't have to say anything. Now get him a nurse, take care of him, right? Another time, Sayyidina Abu Bakr got hit in his eye. What did Uthman ibn Adun say, by the way? Uthman ibn Adun said, O Messenger of Allah, not only did I not have to talk, I wanted to talk, this eye is, the, the good eye is jealous of the bad eye. Like he, wa he enjoyed this. So then the Prophet ﷺ uh, calmed him down and, and took care of him. So what the Prophet brought out of, of contrast was only based upon the state of that person. So a person should... I remember one time having a talk and we have a sister here, Alia Mama. She was at that talk, right? Now, the, the, uh, it was me and it was like a psychiatrist, Muslim psychiatrist. And she said, she gave a great speech. A woman asked a question and she said, well, what if we've been so, through such a trauma that we can't bear it? I said, who judges that you can't bear it? That's a judgment, right? No, she said, no, no, it's so bad, it cannot be bear. I can, it, it's not possible to bear it. I said, you just made that judgment, right? And from there, that foundational point, you're going to move on, okay? So you're still making that judgment. Why would you make that? It's your choice. So, but the person could not fathom you know, getting out of that, it's like a vice grip on your head, right? 
and it, you have to view reality from that perspective, but you created that perspective, right, that you cannot bear it. I said, who said you can't bear it? Like, is there, because I'm not saying that it's easy for you to bear, but I am saying there is no standard out there. There's no me scientific measure that says I can bear it or I can't, right? It's all your choice. And it's a mentality that you have, as Sheikh Yahya said yesterday, a growth mentality. From this struggle, right, I can grow. All right, Muslim Cowboy is here. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum assalam. Muslim Cowboy, you should follow him. He's our uh, brother from Al Madina Al Munawwara, from Texas to Madina Al Munawwara, and he's trying to do dawah to a group of people that not a lot of people are reaching, which are the cowboys of the of the South. I mean, we to us they're cowboys, but they're the people of Texas. He's trying to do dawah to them. Right? I mean, here's a brother. He faced a lot of pushback when he became Muslim. I know, Brandon, I don't know if, you, if I'm allowed to say this, but he faced a lot of pushback when he became Muslim. He could have easily said, oh, I can't bear this. No, I'm going to get stronger from this. It's not going to break me down. I'm going to get stronger from this. And you, but the key is you have to keep saying it and you have to catch yourself. Every time you get into a complaining mode, you got to go back. It could have been 10 times worse. And I'm going to grow from this so on and so forth. You have to have that, that approach. <clears throat> so, at tahadduth bin ni'ma, you have to say it with your mouth. Because when you say it in, with your mouth, it gets stronger in your mind. Next hadith. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu narrated, at lunch or supper, bread and meat never appeared together at the same table of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except when there were guests. So on a regular day, the Prophet only got one of them, unless there were guests. Right. Right. The ulama gave various meanings of this. They said that when he partook in it, he was partaking in it only because the guests were partaking of it. Otherwise, any wealth that he had, he took the very bare minimum he needed and he gave his money away. Nawfal ibn Iyas al-Hadili radiallahu anhu said, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf said, okay, he is one of the great Sahabi of the Ashra al-Mubashra, of course, who had been giving glad tidings into Jannah. He was one of the ten. And he was an associate, and verily, he was the best of associates. Okay. Nofil is saying this about Abdurrahman bin Auf. Once we were returning from a place with him, Abdurrahman bin Auf, by the way, was the, the most one who excelled most in business, him and Sayyidina Uthman. On returning, we went with him to his house. When we went home, he first took a shower. After he had taken the shower, bread and meat was brought in on a big plate. So they're all traveling, and they came home, they return home, and Abdurrahman bin Auf invites them bread, meat, other foods. And he began to weep. I asked, what happened? Why are you crying? He began to say, until the demise of the Messenger wasallam, for the Prophet's whole life, neither he nor his family ever had a plate like this with bread and meat in it at the same time. Now after the Messenger wasallam, as far as I think, this wealthy status of ours is no good. I want to see why the Sahaba their hearts were so pure is because they didn't partake in a lot of worldliness. Right? We may partake in a lot of worldliness and uh, our path these days tends to be more about knowledge and refutation of heretical ideas that are coming. Right? Whereas the Sahaba's time, there weren't a lot of these heretical ideas. What they needed was to be massive mountains of iman and in order to have that they needed to be away from the dunya that was their a way for them if we did that that would be good too but what's more important for us is to have knowledge and to transmit that knowledge okay. that, these sahaba the number of shubuhat in the world shubuhat is false ideas in the world uh, we're, too, we're, we're, we're not that many like paganism. What else was there? Not that many false ideas. So every generation has its virtues and every generation has uh, its way and what they need. So when we look at this, we have to also uh, think about it. We're cutting in and out. 
No. It's on their end? It's on YouTube's end? Okay, good. Next. Chapter. Babu. Ma jaa fi asma'i Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The names of Sayyid al the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna li asma'an. I have many names. Ana Muhammadun wa ana Ahmadu wa ana al-mahi alladhi yamhu Allahu bihi al-kufr. Wa ana al-hashiru alladhi yuhsharu al-nasu ala qadami. Wa ana al-aqibu. Wa al-aqibu alladhi laysa ba'dahu nabi. Ya Qadianis, did you hear that hadith? <laughs> or do you reject all hadith? There is no Nabi after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Qadianism is kufr because it negates what is known in religion by necessity which is explicit and repeated many, many, many times to the point that even any Muslim child knows that there is no Prophet coming, no new Prophet, no new Sharia coming. The only Prophet that is coming is Prophet is not a new Prophet. He's Sayyidina Isa and he's coming with the Sharia of Sayyidul Kaunayn, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وحدثنا محمد بن طريف الكوفي حدثنا أبو بكر بن عياش عن عاصم عن أبي وائل عن حذيفة قال حذيفة ممنوع من الصرف so we say عن حذيفة not عن حذيفة ممنوع من الصرف you notice the names that end with تامربوطه is one of the six categories of words that are limited in the vowels that they can get at the end الصرف is placing the uh, at tasrif is to do something with something right so i have 100 percent tasrif over this ipad i could do whatever i want with it it's my ipad right so that's the meaning of a sarf in in grammar a sarf means the ability to put any short vowel on the end of the word fatha dhamma kasra zabr pesh what is it the the um uh, Zir Zabar Pesh, I think that's how it is. Uh, I should know this because of how many, uh, you know, Qariza is going to be upset with me if I don't know this. I think it's Zir Zabar Pesh. So, Al Mamnu'a min al Sarf means it is Mamnu'a min al Sarf al Mutlaq. Means you cannot put anything you want, you cannot put Kasra. You could put Dhamma, you could put a Fatha, but you cannot put a Kasra. Why? Because it would, it's difficult on the tongue of the Arabs. What is the Arabic language? It's just what the, how the Arabs spoke. Right? However they spoke. Okay? So if they found it difficult to put a kasra on a letter, under a letter, they just put a fatah instead. So they would not say, An hudayfati. They would say, An hudayfata. I saw the Prophet, peace be upon him, one day on one of the roads of Medina. فقال أنا محمد وأنا أحمد وأنا نبي الرحمة ونبي التوبة وأنا المقفة وأنا الحاشر ونبي الملاحمي. So how is it that the Prophet once time said uh, that I have five names and another time he said these names and each whenever the Prophet said this he did not say five only. He just listed that five. And another time he listed other ones. So when you go to Dila'il al-Khairat, and Dila'il al-Khairat talks about the names of the Prophet wasallam, those are his names and his attributes. His descriptions. Okay. In the hadith, at special occasions, special names have been mentioned. All the names are not compiled in one hadith. So, for example, one hadith states seven name of my names are mentioned in the Quran: Muhammad, Ahmad, Yasin, Taha, Muzammil, Mudathir, and Abdullah. Okay. So, um, these the the hadith ends with seven of my names are mentioned in the Quran. Okay, and then the ulama. Uh, judge them to be Muhammad, Ahmad, Yasin, Taha, Muzzam, Al-Muddathir, and Abdullah. 
سبحان الذي أسرى بأبده Jubair ibn Mut'im radiyallahu ta'ala narrated from his father who said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said I have many names I am Muhammad I am Ahmad I am Al-Mahi okay. I am Al-Hashir I am Al-Aqib The last three names are mentioned with their reasons The reasons for the first two mentions are, names are not mentioned What is the difference between Muhammad and Ahmad? Muhammad is the most praised quantifiably Meaning in numbers. In numbers. Ahmed is most praised or most praiseworthy in quality. What do we have here in the dunya that we can prove objectively? Quantity. All right? Quality people, people could say, no, no, I don't believe he's the most praiseworthy. I believe Jesus is more praiseworthy or someone else is more praiseworthy. Okay, fine. We can't stop you from believing that. Let's go to quantity. I don't think anybody can win that debate that any human being is more praised than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We praise him more than the Christians praise Jesus. And they hold Jesus to be the Son of God or God himself. Whatever it is that they believe. Okay? Even that. You go to church and even... T- Jesus is hardly praised. Right? In some churches, they give a speech, they talk about life, they talk about wellness. Where is Jesus? Right? Uh, uh, Protestant churches a lot of times you go and it's just like this wellness program I didn't see a hadith mentioned of Sayyidina Isa right give me anything give me something give me even sometimes a verse from the Bible is not even mentioned right or it's like a vague verse that fits into modern wellness uh, do, do the Christians have gatherings of Dhikr Isa in anywhere that's close to what the Muslims have Imam al-Jazuli author Dila al-Khairat I need to get the footage I'm going to share with you one day inshallah the footage maybe tomorrow of what Imam al-Jazuli has a little, little masjid and he's buried on the side he's the author of a book called Dila al-Khairat which is the most popular book on the praise of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa that his masjid is I'm pretty sure it's like definitely Fajr to Isha if not Dhuhr to Isha uh, Majal Salah on the Prophet, peace be upon him. That book is recited there, public recitation. You can sit in and join it if you want. Pick up your copy, look what page they're on, and join it. Uh, Qari Zahid and Habib, on the way to the Umrah, they went. Two of our, our, our Imam who teaches the Hibs of Quran, and uh, uh, one of our brothers here. They went to Imam al Jazuli's masjid, and they found that. There's a tilawa of, of that book, recitation of that book, of those salawat on the messenger, all day. All day. Non-stop. Different shifts coming in. They just went at a random time and they were doing it. Probably, I bet you, any Muslim city in the world, of the major Muslim cities, Cairo, Fez, Istanbul, you can go and ask, when is the majlis of Salah on the Prophet Wasallam? Somebody will tell you there's got to be one to two to three, maybe seven a week. Almost guaranteed. In this day and age where deen is like thin uh, in the populations of people. It's thin, like deen is not some very strong, okay, even in Muslim cities. But there's going to be gatherings of Salah on the Prophet It's impossible to be in a Muslim city without hearing the name Muhammad. The adhan is going to go five times a day, right? You could be in the most Christian of all. You go to Rome, and I ask you how many times you're going to hear the word Jesus. No one's going to be calling on a minaret. Jesus is whatever, right? And th- and we're not trying to have a competition with Sayyidina Isa. That's our prophet that we have to honor and love. And we should elevate the dhikr name of Sayyidina Isa because he's coming back. That's aqidah. That's obligatory for us to believe. Okay. It's obligatory for us to believe that. So we're, we're not even saying that. But there is, we're not saying anything to, to, to uh, degrade him, but we're saying even his followers, who are supposed to believe that he's divine, don't mention him as much as we mention the Prophet, who we say he's human. Nobody can ever make the argument that anybody on the world in the world is mentioned with more times in more books than Sayyid al-Kawnain, so his name is a proof. 
of his truthfulness. His very name is a name, a, 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 a sign of his proof, uh, proof, uh, truthfulness. Okay. So the so the name of the Prophet ﷺ derives both Ahmed and Muhammad derive from Hamd, which is praise. Muhammad most quantitatively praised. Ahmed most praiseworthy qualitatively. And so that's why he it is said that Ahmed is the Prophet's name in paradise. And Muhammad is his name in this world. Okay. The Malaika and the previous Anbiya have praised the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his name is mentioned in those early books. Okay, as the Quran mentions that the Prophet's name Ahmed is in the Bible, and there's a whole uh, genre that translates and finds which verses those are. Okay. Next hadith. I once met the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also from Hudayfa, and he said, I am Muhammad, I am Ahmed, I am Nabi al-Rahma, Nabi al-Tawbah, Nabi al-Muqaffa, or Ana al-Muqaffa wa Ana al-Hashir, wa Ana Nabi al-Malahim, meaning I'm the Prophet under under this pro, under him there will be more wars fought and that's a praiseworthy quality because wars are only bad if their cause is bad if their purpose is bad and their method is bad but if a war is just and it is taking down tyranny and oppression it's good so he's nabi al malahim that's a good thing you should be proud of that because some wars are are are, are good right Go to American histories and the Revolutionary War. Do we say, oh, it's a shame that our founding fathers raised wars? No, we say the farmers, they took the pitchforks and they took whatever they could and then they fought and we praise this. They taught to praise this thing like they're Sahaba or something. Revolutionary War. And to be honest, the way they put it, it's like inspiring. It's like, I wish I was there too, right? That's how they put portray the American Revolutionary War because this is oppression. You're taxing us and you're not representing us. So wars can be good. Wars are not all bad. And that's otherwise the prophet would not have said, I am the prophet of wars. Okay, so some wars are good. Al-Hashir means that he is the, um, the, the first one to be resurrected on the day of judgment. And then everyone's resurrected after him. And Nabi al-Malahim also refers to that his ummah is able to bear the most calamities. His ummah can bear being fought because it's that strong, both in iman and in numbers. The Dajjal, for example, will wage a great malhamah upon the mu'mineen, which is one of the signs of akhir zaman end of time, is one of the major signs that the Imam Mahdi will come out and he will fight and he will have great gains and great victories to the point that Iblis will have to pull out his final and last card. He pulls from the bullpen, he pulls out uh, the Dajjal because that's it. The, the Ummah has been purified and it's now expanding and he can't stop it. So he has to pull out his final trump card, which is the Dajjal himself. And the Dajjal himself will lure many, many people onto his side, but he still cannot finish off these Muslims. So he ends up having to literally kill them all. And in this one, there are many different sayings. Some say six out of every seven will be killed in this. Not humans, but Muslims in this battle. Wherever it belongs, the old Islamic lands, who knows, such as like from, from Egypt to Syria to Iraq, Arabia, who knows where, Allah knows best where this war will be waged. But there will be such a, an amount of bloodshed that there will be, the people will say, this is the greatest war. This is the greatest killing that has ever happened to any nation. And it will happen to the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So we will bear that and survive through it. Part of a sign of strength is that you can take hits. Every single enemy Every type of enemy that any prophet had, we have that type of enemy. So we have Qawm Lut. We have uh, pagans in India fighting the Muslims. Qawm Lut fighting uh, believers everywhere in the world. But here mainly, in the Western countries. 
We have false scholars that side with hypocr- with with their sultans and oppress other scholars. That's what the Yahud did. We have that. Name any fitna that occurred to any prophet. We have the likeness of it in our ummah. And that is a sign of the prophet's strength. That his ummah, okay, through his teaching 1,400 years ago, he didn't have to send prophet after prophet after prophet. One prophet has trained, his teaching is so clear, so perfect, that 1,400 years later, 1,500 years later almost, if we count the few years before the hijrah takes us past 1,450, okay, his ummah is facing all of these calamities at once and still thriving and surviving and growing faster than any other deen. So that's from the meanings of Nabiul Malahim, the prophet who will also be able to bear these, this killing against his people. Okay. We'll stop here for segment number one. Segment number two, I want to talk to you about something very interesting. But first, if you enjoy this podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash Safina Society and be a patron and benefit uh, and be someone who benefits this uh, channel and this live stream. Now, what I want to talk to you about is there's a funny guy. His name is Neon Dion Sanders also known as Primetime. This guy is an entertainer. First and foremost, he's an entertainer and a businessman, but he did it through sports, and he was one of the few players ever to play two professional sports at once and also thrive in them as like an all-star and a champion. And he played baseball and he played football. And one of the unique things about him, and the reason I bring him up, is that Whenever he sa- he does something major in his life, he always says, God told me. God sent me. Right? If God hadn't told me to do it, I don't have done it. So he's always talking about this, which caused somebody to say, well, why doesn't God ever talk to us, Muslims? All right, so first, he, so let's basically break this down. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak to people? after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, And the answer is, speak. The way that prophets received, no. But does he send messages? Yes. Okay. But these messages have parameters. Otherwise, we have chaos. And there's an adab in how we express this. So let's take a look at the first parameter, which is, upon what would Allah speak? Or send a message to a person. Okay. Firstly, that message would never be anything that contradicts the sacred law that Allah already gave. That's the first thing. Okay. So you are not bringing a new law. Secondly, the ilham, the 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 message that Allah sends to a person, will never also never be the commandment to do an obligation. Or a recommendation. Why? Because that would be unnecessary. The stronger, more authoritative speech is already the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. So why would it need then the lesser authoritative, speculative uh, repetition? So there's never been an ilham. There, has there ever been a wali? I had an ilham today that we should pray Fajr. You, why would you have an ilham when you have a, an ilham? A personal, private message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is lower on the rung of authority than the Qur'an. The Qur'an is for everybody. It's recited. It's from the Prophet. It's guaranteed. The word of Allah. And ilham can never contradict it nor repeat it. That's why you're never going to have, oh, guess what? I had ilham that I shouldn't commit zina today. No. So that's number one. The content, we have to look at the content of what a divine speech would be or a divine message to a person would be. It would not be contradicting the sacred law nor repeating it. If if you want Allah to talk to you, He already spoke to you. The whole Qur'an is for you. He's addressing you. That's how we have to read the Qur'an. Allah is addressing me personally in this book. Okay, 
in, in the sense of it is a message for me to practice, for me to benefit from. Not in the sense of that when uh, that uh, it was revealed to us. So that's obvious. So what is the ilham about, this type of ilham or this type of divine inspiration to a person? It will always, it will always be about a halal thing that has great benefit behind it. Okay? As we said, clearly Allah will not tell you to do something against the sacred law. Neither haram nor makruh. Nor, because that would contradict the sacred law. Nor would he tell you an obligation nor a recommendation. That's an unnecessary repetition. So what's left? The halal that has a great benefit behind it. Meaning that if you were to do it and claim or not claim, with a claim or without a claim, you'd be innocent, right? You'd be innocent. So that's number one, the content of that speech. Number two, such ilham, if it was ever to come to a person and if that person were to ever divulge such a thing, it would be a sign of his righteousness. Therefore, such ilham only comes to the clean heart, which means the Muslim who is outwardly and inwardly upon the example of the Prophet ﷺ. The dirty heart can never receive divine ilham. In the same way that a, 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 you, I cannot plug uh, this plug, all right, can never go into a ring. This little, this little plug here cannot go into a book, right? Not certain, th- this doesn't decrease in the strength of this plug. So Allah's speech and, and these favors from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this ilham from Allah ta'ala, does, ilham means inspiration. It does not go to the dirty heart. If it did, we would all take that person as an example. When Allah inspires something to a abd, to a person, it's a, it's a type of stamp of approval that at this moment you can follow this person. He's upright. Okay? The sun will not pass through dirty water. If the water's all dirty, okay, and I got a pool of, a, a, a glass full of dirty water and I flash the su- uh, 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 sunlight or a flashlight, it will not pass through. So it only come to the clean heart. That person who has a good reputation amongst the Muslims practices outwardly and inwardly. Number three, how do we express this? Number one, and it's in the Qasida of Muhammad ibn Habib. If you receive such a thing, you are not a prophet. Keep it to yourself. The prophet, the messengers, have to announce, I have a message from Allah. Why? Because that message is for us. And he has to tell us he's a prophet. How can we follow him if he's not a prophet? If we, or if we don't know he's a prophet. But nobody needs to follow you. So even if all of the conditions of ilham were met to a person and they received it and it is true, they keep it to themselves. And if they ever mention anything, they only mention it to those who will believe them, not envy them, and understand its weight and its authority. And they will never say, Allah spoke to me. No Muslim will ever, ever say, God spoke to me. That is a position for the prophets only. Ilham may come in the form of a vision, in the form of a hatif. While reciting the Quran, an ayah comes and it is as if Allah spoke it directly to you. Ilham, this is all we call this ilham. The mother of Musa received ilham. What to do with her baby when she was in trouble. But no Muslim will ever say God spoke to me the way some of these guys do. Uh, sitting wearing flip-flops and a, and a baseball cap, God said to me, right? And th- here's a funny thing. Um, Deion Sanders is smart enough to only use that phrase in things that are, cal- are, are clearly nobody's going to disagree with. Right, so he goes to Jackson State, which is a historically black college, in order to like lift them up and do something great with them, and he says, "God sent me here," right, and that so that benefits, you know, it's there's benefit there in the eyes of people, and then 
Oh, you get an offer for five times the salary. God told me to go to Colorado State. Really? To go get five times the salary, right? To leave those people behind. But a rational person would say, oh, of course. I mean, you're going to get five times the salary, right? They're here giving you peanuts, and here they're giving you millions of dollars. So he always puts it in a context that people would recognize. So he's smart enough. He never puts it in a context that's like foolish or something like that. Anyway, that's, that's him. So the third thing, we would never speak the way he speaks or the way many of these evangelicals speak. God spoke to me. That's absurdity. Show me the proof. Okay. So even if a waliullah was to receive an ilham from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we believe that theoretically that is possible, he would never speak like that. Okay. He may simply say, uh, it was made beloved to me. Right? Or... I, something inspired me. I was inspired to. He would not even attribute it to Allah. You're not a prophet. So you have to have adab in how you speak. Certain things are limited to prophets. Now let's talk about ideas. Okay. <sighs> Inspirations come from five sources. Okay. The first, let's take them from the worst, from bad to the good. The first two are from small devils and big devils. Okay. These, are, these are the thoughts that come to human beings. They come from small shaitans and from big shaitans. The small shaitan inspires you to do bad deeds so that you could cloud your heart. Only when your heart is clouded can the big shaitan get to work. When your heart is clouded, the big shaitan gets to work and he throws in seeds of doubt. The big shaitans want to affect your beliefs. The little shaitans just do the preparatory work. Cloud up your heart with sins. So the small shaitans will try to get you addicted to some sin or try to get you to commit some different kind of sins. Getting you ready for the big shaitan and the big shaitan will sprinkle different false beliefs in your heart and you will see which one sticks. That is what the big shaitan does. Okay? That's the difference between the small shaitan and the big shaitan. Okay? The third hadith that happens in your mind is from yourself. And that is that matter that is neither good for you nor bad for you in, in your deen. Such that uh, every one of us has our own instinct and our own fitra. You may love red, I may love yellow. You may love spicy food. You may All of these relative things that just, it's for you. That's your hadith of your nafs. Okay? That's the hadith of your nafs that's, it's just your fitra, your inherent nature. What about your base and lowly self? Your base and, now we're, we're on the subject number three here, which is yourself. Yourself has three different aspects. It has your natural instinctive self. That's your tastes, your temperaments. Neither is it good nor bad. It's just how you are. Next is your bad side. Every one of us has nafs. Nafs ammara bisu. Nafs ammara bisu, its sign is the addictive or the habitual habit. Okay? So if I was to do something one time, that was bad. I can blame shaitan for that. But if I'm addicted to something, I only blame myself for that. And the two could come together because shaitan just tries to get to find your addiction and then he encourages you to do it, then you get addicted to it. See, people think shaitan can read your mind. He can't read your mind. He could just read your behavior. He could see your behavior. He could see that I, tr I got him to smoke weed today. All right, what's his reaction like? Well, he's vomiting. He's disgusted. He didn't like it. Okay, so you could say shaitan got him to smoke weed, but you didn't like it. You don't do it again. And you never did it again. That's shaitan. Shaitan wants you to disobey Allah in any way, shape, and form. He doesn't care. But the nafs, the ego, the bad side of us, it latches onto something and it never lets go. Okay? So, okay, I got him to gamble. Well, what was his reaction? Oh, his face lit up. He was amazed. He, he is really into this. So now we know that he loves gambling. So keep whispering to gamble 
until now that become, person becomes an addict. So the nefs has an addictive attachment attribute to it. Once you could become addicted and, attra- a, 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 and, a, and attached to something, yes, that may be that shaitan got it started, but your nefs took over. So that is the hallmark of the nefs. That attachment and addiction to one set thing. Okay? That is the sign of the nefs. Okay? What about the ruh? The ruh side of a person is a, the good side of a person. That side of the person which inclines towards good qualities of things. Okay? Human beings are born with that too. We're born with the good side, a bad side, and a neutral, your temperament and your inclinations. All right, so now let's move from number three, which is yourself. Source number four. What is source number four? So really, we should break it up into four. The shaitan, shaitan, we could divide it into big and small shaitans. The nafs, your own self, our own selves, is the ego, the, the natural fitra, and our soul, the good side. Now we go to item number three, which is angels. And angels whisper on the category of good deeds. They will whisper for you to do good deeds. That's what they're going to whisper for you to do. Now, all of these that we've talked so far, all of them you can accept or reject. All of them. Not this fourth one. The fourth source of inspirations and thoughts is Allah himself. And Allah himself, when he gives, directs, or places a thought in your mind, you cannot reject it. You can never reject it. You will accept it. And his, the category of such thoughts is al-yaqeenu billah. Is the thought that says, Wallahi, this deen is al-haqq. Wallahi, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is al-haqq. Wallahi, this Qur'an is the word of Allah. All of that yaqeen that goes in our head, that is directly from Allah. And it can never be rejected. It's always from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's your sources of thoughts. Okay. And all of that, what I, what I just said, is in the answer of the question um, of can God speak to us afterwards? Okay. Uh, after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All right, that leaves us to segment numero trace, okay? And do we have a segment today? We haven't, you know, there's a segment we haven't done for a while. Clown World, Recreational Outrage. A hilarious uh, thing about Clown World, Recreational Outrage is that I'm telling you, we have reached the point even sins are not being done right anymore. And we're commanding, we're like, there's commanding right and forbidding wrong. Now you're sinning wrong. So Miss Universe, this beauty pageant, is now, uh, it's now owned by uh, a trans woman. So this person who's a trans woman, got up and said... What does that even mean? Wait, they're, they're a man? They were a man, and now they say they're a woman. Worse. Yeah. Worse and, and they... Uh, she, he or she gets up there and says, the Miss Universe pageant, whatever, will no longer be controlled by men. It is now owned by a trans woman. And all the women are clapping. Oh my gosh, you got fooled. Bro, men have still defeated you. They just took on your uniform. And once they took on your, your, your guys and your uniform, you have no rights anymore, right? You've lost everything. Because now anyone says, I'm a trans woman, let me go to the women's locker room. You have lost all your privacy. You've lost all your achievements because the trans women will outdo all these other women in every sport. They're destroying them in every sport. Swimming, running, everything. The, and, and out of sympathy, they're going to win the beauty pageants too. So that is our, our ridiculous segment of clown world recreational outrage. Okay. 
Here. I have never felt, this is this year, a couple days ago. What is this woman, trans woman, competing in? Rugby. A tackle sport. Women's rugby. Can you imagine if there's a women, women's football league, NFL, and a, 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 a guy playing like Lawrence, who's out there in football, who's on the defensive side? Indama Kinsu. <laughs> Do you know how big Indama Kinsu is? He's bigger than a refrigerator. Indama Kinsu must be six foot three and more than 370 pounds. Look him up. These Hawaiian guys are like made for football, right? So what does this transgender woman say? I have no advantages over my competitors, she says. Okay. No, okay. She became a woman. He became a woman. And now says, wow, I never felt this way before. I'm the strongest and the tallest player in the league. And before this, said, before this, I was a shell of an athlete. I, w I had no advantages over my competitors. Now that this guy has transitioned and become a woman... All right, and they got the before and after, and of course, the purple hair. All right, man, um, I got to give it to them. They give us so much material, right? We wouldn't have all this material if it wasn't for these people. Okay, so that's our segment today of clown world recreational outrage because. It is at this point of recreation. You can't take this stuff seriously. What else we have here? Anyway, that's all I have here for Clown World. Oh, here's another one. The Oxford Dictionary. I can't believe this is true. Someone's got to check if it's true because I received it as, as true news. Okay. They're removing the word sin from the dictionary. Can you tell us if that's true? Removing the word sin from the dictionary because the youth find it off-putting. That's how we determine what's a word now? Wait a second. So if I use it in a paper, it, it's going to be marked wrong, Right? Look up the, type in use of sin Oxford Dictionary and type it in, look it up in, um, in news because it should show up in the news. Use of sin Oxford Dictionary, they removed it or something. Yeah, there it is. Christian words deleted from the Oxford Dictionary. That's how we determine what words are. This outrage is like a shahua. What else do they say? Oh, okay. All right, so there we go with segment number three. We hadn't done this for a while. Okay. Uh, Colorado astrophysics professors bemoans her fields saying the cosmos is violent and uh, or vi the cosmos is hyper masculine due to the violent clashes and crashes that exist within space that's definitely a cloud clown world material right there you literally cannot make this stuff up Someone, someone's asking and I'm, I'm curious about this too what do you say about like taking like an offensive type of approach to uh, getting rid of these woke shibuhats yeah shibuhats or the woke all that stuff it's all the same pretty much uh, the, the woke is just something you laugh at at this point 
there's no way to actually take this stuff seriously. But the atheism that they're promoting, that is something that we have to constantly be talking about. Right? Um, right? Uh, that's something that we have to talk about. Their atheism and their... Um, those ideas and sex, the ideas about the body and sexuality, we have to constantly be talking about that. But this uh, gender stuff, at this point, it's it's something that you, you can't talk about it because there's no sense. Be why do I say that? And I say that not even in common in a common way. I say that literally as an, as an argument because arguments are composed of default knowledge, right? Default discernible knowledge. If we're going to negate default discernible knowledge that's discernible to our own two eyes, we cannot build an argument. So you cannot argue against somebody who is capable and willing to undermine the defaults of life. Okay? If someone is going to tell me gravity doesn't exist, I don't exist, we cannot talk to them. You cannot talk and have a discussion with somebody who says, I don't exist. Okay. I question my own. There's a philosophical group that says this. There is a philosophical group that says that we don't know if we exist. So we say that we cannot speak to you. And that's why in Aqidah, in Kalam, they say, We cannot talk until you submit to the defaults that are discerned with our own senses anyone who has eyes ears and a brain if you can, if, if you don't submit to that and recognize that we can't talk because every argument is based upon these defaults let me give you an example i can't have a mathematical discussion with somebody if they tell if they don't believe that 2 is always 2 if they say 2 is sometimes 3 i remember one time hilarious someone said two plus two is four right and uh, another guy said no sometimes two plus two could equal five i said come on please don't waste my time he said yes because there is a mathematical language in which two is three so therefore two plus two equals five i said are you in living in cartoon land at that point, it's not what we're talking about anymore. Your imaginary play language, such that 2 plus 2 could equal 5, if 2 sometimes means 3. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, so you're in Mickey Mouse lands at this point. Okay? So here, for example, 2 plus 2 can also be... Uh, zero in mathematics if plus means minus are we playing games here this is la la land okay so uh ma says two plus two can also be two in mathematics by changing the algebra okay then we're playing games okay yes ma it is a game this is four how many fingers am i holding up four do not ma how are you saying it's not a game? It is a game. Yes, you are just changing words. Okay? Just check the max plus algebra. No, look. How many <laughs> fingers am I holding up? Everyone out there. My own, my, my baby kids, whatever. Children. These are four fingers. Two and two. Unless you alter the meanings of words. Okay? That's the only way around this. It goes deep though because like... In its root, like, although math is very, very consistent with reality most of the time, in the end of the day, it's a theory. And mm -hmm. it's math, like the math, algebra, all these things are theories. And yeah. it doesn't mean that everything that comes out of math is automatically right. Correct. Even mathematicians wouldn't say that. They have a theory about this, a theory about that. Yeah. And eventually it leads to kufr because um, when people, like very quickly, I don't know if this is exactly kufr, but it could lead to it, that people say... That a number is uh, infinitely divisible. Mm -hmm. And there's a concept of inf infinity in math. And, of course, we say nothing's infinite without a beginning uh, except Allah. Because mm -hmm. Allah created everything. Yeah. So they go into, and it's all based on a theory, though. 
So the assumption that it's actually tr- like descriptions of reality yeah. is is the wrong assumption. Yeah, it's not always a description of reality. Mm-hmm. Whereas when we talk about algebra, basic arithmetic, I mean, we're describing reality. That's what we're saying. M.A. says, I am a mathematician, okay? Actually, and max plus algebra exists in reality. Where is uh, where is Ahmad when we need him? Max plus algebra. I can guarantee you there is nowhere in reality where two apples add two more apples equals anything other than four apples. We're talking about description of reality here. Okay, we're, that's what we're talking about. Let me get max algebra for dummies. When we're talking about arithmetic, we're talking about the description of realities. Okay? That's what we're talking about. That's what's important to us. Because speech and words are meant to describe realities. Otherwise, we call that a lie. Okay? So, uh, M.A., please tell us exactly how does max algebra exist in reality and in what way could basic arithmetic not be what we all know it to be? Okay, Max algebra, which has been studied for more, for more than 40 years, is an attractive way of describing a class of nonlinear problems appearing, for instance, in machine scheduling, inf- IT information technology, and discrete event dynamic systems. Did you understand anything? <laughs> we are talking about haqa'iq al-umur. Thawabitul umur, daruri knowledge. Daruri in logic refers to the very simple descriptions of things upon which you can make an argument, right? And I, maybe, you know, this is a better question for this yeah. guy. It's, this is so irrelevant, anyways, but I see he says you were defining and as plus. So this is like uh, the judgment of something is dependent on your conceptualization, like what the definitions of things are. Yes. So I guess a question that I would ask is that can 2 plus 2 equal 4 and 2 plus 2 equal 2 with the same definitions? That's with, correct. Right. And From when, one perspective. From, yes. From, that's, that's how we would say You it. cannot shift the perspectives, right? You cannot shift the meanings. And on top of that, we have the concept of tawadha an You just conform to change the rules. Yeah, you change the rules. We're talking about, and also when we say tawadha an nas, not tawadha, tawadha is humble. Tawadha an nas means all people have come to agree that something means something. So, right? We all agree that two is two, and the and plus or and is an addition of that. Okay. All right. Let's see what Ma says. I'm saying. Uh, I'm I'm curious. I think that's what it was because also. Like we were just talking about this in Akhida yesterday with Harakat and Sukun. Yes. Like someone could say, oh, you're standing on a boat. You're still, but you're also moving because you're on a boat. Or mm-hmm. you're still sitting there right now, but you're also moving because you're on the yes. earth and the earth is moving. But, yeah, but we look at it from one perspective. Yes. You, like the reality of something is not all the perspectives possible. Possible, yeah. And in simple speech, when we're talking about daruriyat and haqaiq al-umur, we are speaking about the... Uh, basic wada. Wada means when I say and, two and two is four. Two plus two is four. In the basic wada speech of people, it means the same thing. They're synonymous. Now you can go into some technical terminology, but we're not on that. Remember what we're talking about here. We are talking about haqaiq al umur thabita, meaning the basic discernments, which include that when we speak, we're speaking about what. Most, if not all people, understand by this speech. We're not saying that there are no technical terminologies somewhere else. We are. We admit that. But we do not admit that in the field of, uh, uh, or the scope of daruri facts, daruri knowledge, simple basic discernments of regular human beings. Why do I say this? Because if we don't have that, we can never build on it. It's a starting point. Okay? That's the starting point. So it's that two, two, that, that's the only reason two human beings can ever talk, right? If every time I talk to, to anyone on the street, 
I try to take a word that he says, which has a clear meaning to 99% of the population, and then I go fetch a technical difference and a technical terminology where that word means something else, I can't talk to anybody. And nobody would talk to me. Anyway, let's see what M.A. is saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. You are defining and as plus. Uh, uh, yes, and and plus in the wada, in the terminology, agreed upon terminology, it is the same thing. And now I'm, I hope that I'm, ma I'm making it clear why I'm saying that. I'm not saying that no technical terminology can ever exist and be different from common parlance. But common parlance must be the starting point of any conversation. Okay. If two is three in a language, the other two is also three. So, okay. So Bookworm mentions it by saying math, math conventions, and conventional speech. So that's a good way. Conventions is the agreed upon speech. So in technical terminology, in math, in science, in biology, in history, they have their own conventions. In common parlance, there's another convention. And this is, again, this is such a root matter of like the problems that our society is facing because when somebody says, I can be a woman yeah. and they're a man, it's, it's because of this too. Mm -hmm. They're looking at it from a different perspective. From yeah. what, They're looking at their identity. Yeah. Maybe we should have Sheikh Nisar to come in month to do logic and, and deconstruct uh -huh. this liberal thing yeah. because they're doing the same thing as this. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm not using the plus sign. I'm not using gender as my biological yeah. thing. I'm using it as this technological thing that someone made up and saying that that yeah. has more grounding in reality than what everybody else uses as a definition of gender. Exactly. And what they've done is superimposed upon us yeah. a philosophy that gender and sex, biological sex, are different. It's like somebody don't saying, that. like going to all the schools, you can't tell people two plus two equals four anymore. You have yeah. to say that you don't use plus as and. That's, yeah. not, that's not how we use that, plus. Yeah. That, that we can't have a society if we go that route. All right. MA is just saying, okay, you're confusing and and plus and regular arithmetic, but one can change rules of arithmetic. Atik is saying you're overcomplicating simple things or people overcomplicate simple things. Um, Melody 21 says, because some say one plus one can equal three, take a husband plus wife equals child. <laughs> I guess that's a joke, right? <laughs> uh, Waterman, 2 plus 2 equals 5. 2 plus 2 equals 5 is mathematically incorrect phrase used in 1949 dystopian novel, 1984 by George Orwell. The guy was ahead of his time, I have to say. Okay. Uh, whatever you're saying, it's not the reality. 2 plus 2 equals 4, what we refer to. Don't change words with the reality we refer to. Uh, um. I'm just curious. All right, Waterman says it's already been refuted that 2 plus 2 equals 5. MA says in a max, plus algebra max is plus, and plus is multi, is what, something? So 2 plus 3 is 3, and 2 times 3 is 5. Okay, but that's, the, that's changing. So max algebra has its own terminology, right? That was, should not affect the common parlance and the common reality that two things add two more things you get four things and that is what is the dominant uh uh you know way that people talk they don't use that other language of max algebra anyway we got to talk to Ahmad about this Abid Niazi says one plus one is 11 because I put them to the both together <laughs> Waterman is like, I can't believe we're explaining this. Sophia says, isn't that just logic that is used in math when you use and or right, Boolean functions? So we have to remember, whenever we speak, we should clarify. Are we speaking in common parlance or are we speaking the language, any other language or the convention of a different type of algebra, Right. I think that's important. Okay. 
I tune in to forget about my math finals, and this is the topic, <laughs> says Dino. Oh, my, Dino, you better be studying. Melody21 says, we understand our logic. What they're doing is a pathway to the digest. <laughs> In a sense, it's a pathway to the digest if, if we cannot have, if the haqqaiq al-umur are now being questioned, right? Now, if this thing, I'm not picking on MA here, but I'm saying, if this stuff was to get widespread, and now you have people saying 2 plus 3, 2 plus 2 can equal 5. It, it is though with the gender, like it, That's, like yeah. like the haqaiq of gender. Yeah, everybody's known gender as the biological definition. Yeah, now someone's trying to change it to the shad a shad definition that yes. it's gender is your identity. Yeah, what you identify as, mm -hmm. which That's, which is something that we will never see. Identity is something that's inside yourself, that has nothing fixed about it, right? So I also identify as as. Uh, what if I identify as Asian? Why can't I identify as Asian? Why can't I identify as Norwegian? Why can't I identify as being 35? Why can't I identify as being 6'2"? And I asked Sheikh Murad this yesterday. I was like, with harakat and sukun, yeah. why do we have to look at it from one perspective? He gave a good answer, but also what Hassan said was like, if you don't look, if you look, try to look at it from multiple like, perspectives, yeah. then there's going to be a ton of contradictions. So your example, the example Ryan just gave, he said, you're standing on a boat. You're standing still on a boat, but clearly the boat is moving. Or you could say the earth or a train or whatever. Okay? So in one sentence, you can only speak, a, refer to one perspective. The moment you shift into another perspective, you have to say so. Right? You have to say so. So you could say, my limbs are still. Yes, your limbs are still. But my whole body is moving. You have to, so limbs, body. You have to mention the perspective. Do you ever see a riddle that's like a bad riddle because it's actually not a riddle? Is when they alter, right, the perspective on you, okay? And it's like a bad riddle. It's a riddle that doesn't work. Uh, Chocolate Wallace says, this is the equivalent of justifying illogical phenomenon by quantum mechanics. A normal person doesn't talk or think in terms of max algebra, Okay. If max algebra, I'm saying that one has to be clear about which axiom one is using. Yes, that's true. But what we're saying here is that when normal people are speaking, unless they announce that they are now speaking in a technical terminology, then the assumption is they're speaking in conventional parlance. That's fair to say, right? And even in the Arabic language, we say that when a, a single synonym is used, we refer to that word. It's, so, for example, faqir and miskin. If I say they, they have a technically different meaning. The faqir, he has absolutely nothing. The miskin, he, or, sorry, the faqir, he has, but not enough. The miskin has absolutely nothing, right? So, but if we're sitting there talking, and there's a guy in, with pants and a dinky old cell phone, and he looks so poor, and someone says, man, that guy's miskin. Nobody should correct him and say, no, he's faqir. Because he does have something. Why? Because in common parlance, they're all synonymous. This is a qaida in Arabic language. If we're talking technically, in a technical setting like zakah, then yes, we separate between faqir and miskin. But in common parlance, we don't separate. Okay? And it's very important why this common parlance comes in because revelation comes in the common parlance of the Arabs. Dawa is done in common parlance. Children understand common parlance. Common folk speak common parlance. So that's what one of the um, important... All right, Anzala Islam says, Sheikh, I think we should understand in terms as if we have two apple and we bring two more apple on table, we will not see five apples. We will only see four. Yes, that's exactly what we mean. Yasin Kanaboy says no, nobody really knows what max algebra is, though. Okay. Mini Star says, dare I even ask? Okay. 
The concept of addition is still same no matter what term we use. And they're talking about it's Boolean logic. It's just defining what are the rules of arithmetics. Okay. Or it's not Boolean logic, he says. All right. Can we move on now? So the, the, I guess to the transition question. Maybe, yes. Maybe it's not even a transition question. But someone asks, like, do we step out of outside of this paradigm completely to try to create a functional society? Proper, proper, you know, built on foundations. I don't see how you can ever exit the, the modern world. Everything's all tied up together. And you can't get people to reduce their, their way of living. You cannot get people to go live on a commune somewhere because the next generation will not accept it. It's the nature of human beings when they see a better way of living is to be attracted to it. And the only way that they won't go to it is by some force opposing them. So the, the hope for us, I believe, is to stick with a strong jama'ah. Okay. Abdul Hafiz Ayutandi says, I took this math class from my minor in math. They proved that an infinite sum of zero is one. You just have to draw a line between all that theoretical stuff and reality. The only way that they could prove this is by altering some definition. Right? I don't even know what this is or what the proof is, but it is just in, in terms of reality, if I keep adding nothing to a table every single day, for a thousand years, I will not ever get one thing. So remember what, uh, what the Muslims started to use math for, to calculate things that exist. Of course, math existed with other civilizations, but when the Muslims sat out and they mentioned the purpose of this, it is to count things that exist in the world. Okay? And that is an important part of our logic. Speech is to describe things that exist. Okay. Maz H says, What is the interpretation of witnessing battle of Badr in, oh, and observing Hadrat Abu Bakr in a dream? Allah knows best, but it's a good thing. Jay Perez says, I tried to identify as rich, but nothing happened. <laughs> That's a good one. Enzi says, I feel like for both gender and maths, if you showed this unusual logic to a fifth grader, even they would know you're doing mental backflips to get to your thesis. If a child can see it, why not adults? Thank you very much. Okay. That's the point that we're trying to make here. And our message comes for the at the, 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 at the daruri level, at the simple basic discernment level that Allah created us with. Allah created us with discernment, right? Basic discernment that we're created with. If we lose that, we can never advance. That has to be the foundation and the bedrock, okay? There was a woman who dressed up as a cat recently and went to the town hall of, or of the school or whatever. And she started saying, meow, meow, I'm a cat and I would like to be treated as one. Of course, she's making a mockery of the gender thing, right? But her argument was that basic discernment we have waged war on the fundamentals of discernment okay something we're created with it's a fitra we are different than animals we're created with brains even animals have a basic discernment if you pour water from a tree on a jaguar the jaguar will not look right or left he'll look up okay basic discernment if you roar really loudly at a at a, a, a hyena the hyena will not recognize prey. It will recognize a threat, a lion. But if you make a zebra sound, the hyena will start watering his mouth. His mouth will start watering. Uh, right? So even animals are created with basic discernment. And what we're witnessing here is that if basic discernment breaks down, why was that sister keep saying that this is from the Dajjal? She's right. Because the premise of Dajjal attracting all these people to something blatantly false is the idea that people will no longer trust their basic discernment of what their eyes see and what their brain knows true. Okay. Be it in maths, as the British call it, maths, or be it in gender. 
or be it in anywhere else. Okay. Let's see what all these comments. So MA is saying, yes, people are now changing language and rules. Okay. They're just changing language and rules. And they're negating and basically shutting out basic discernment that you're a guy, that you're a woman, that two plus two is four, things like that. And he's just saying, I'm just saying, be careful and don't generalize. Fine. From now on, we'll, we will mention in common parlance, in the مَا تَوَاضَعَ النَّاسُ عَلَيْهِ what the people have agreed. You know that that is a type of law for us. What the people are, have agreed to be the language. Okay, So if I say go north on Route 1 and then take 18 north from there and then you go and you end up in New York but you said no, I, I needed to go to Philly. I say no, no, no. I meant north to me means south. So you should have taken one south. Right? So, fine. If we have to mention it, every single time we'll mention that we are speaking in common parlance. Melody, I do think that slowly we are being isolated from the society. Most, it used to be back in the day, you have to check if something on TV is haram or halal to watch. It's mostly, a lot of it's haram today. So even the basic things that people watch on TV, you can't watch a lot of it. Most of it. Maybe almost the majority of it. Uh, jobs. Pediatricians are now being forced into the concept of uh, a, a lot of these gender concepts. Counselors are being forced into this. A lot of people are being forced in their profession. They almost have to retreat from the profession itself, right? I knew a brother who was gung-ho about politics for, for ages, he wanted to get into politics, right? Within a year, he bounced out. Can't do it without sacrificing my dean. So we are slowly being uh, pushed out. Maz is looking for a wife. Guys and girls, sisters, I mean. Um, well, Maz, what you should do is go to mawadda, nbse.org forward slash mawadda. All right, genuine question. Abed Niaz says, what's the value of the proof if you have to change the definitions? And my, ask, my other question is, what is the actual application of it, right? Does it have an application? So what is the difference between this algebra and a bunch of kids who make up their own secret language, right? Which will never be spoken outside of their play session, right? It's a fair question. That's the question. What is actually the the uh, the practical benefit of this new language? For example, in World War II, they made up a whole bunch of languages to communicate during war. So there's a benefit. Stranger says, if the awliya have more trials as they're closer to the prophets, how do we reconcile this with the fact that istighfar and salawat, open doors of provisions, happiness, acceptance of dua, because they have greater blessings as well. And when we say they have greater trials, that does not take away that they have great blessings too. And it does not mean that the awliya are always in misery. When they get tested, they get tested with heavy trials. But it does not negate that a lot, a lot of their life is also filled with blessings. BLM, Slave King says, the greatest lie ever told. I don't know what this is all about, but he's saying watch it, okay? And look where all the money for George Floyd's fund went to. It went to LGBT organizations, almost $80 million. We're now on Instagram. Bi Qadri says, come to Miftah, inshallah, bi ta'ala. 
What does Islam say about people who feel they were born wrong gender? Islam says that they need some kind of help to make them feel their feelings into accord with the visible reality. Okay? We don't alter the visible reality according to our feelings. Okay? Alter your physical body according to your feelings. That's our belief on that position. And for example, if I came up to you, guys, guys, I feel like I'm taller than LeBron James and I'm a better boxer than Mike Tyson and I'm a better uh, quarterback than Tom Brady and I should be paid as such as an athlete. I feel that way. Teams should pay me that much. What are you going to say? Oh, I genuinely feel that way and... I feel that way so much, I'm going to commit suicide if you say I'm not better than Tom Brady. Because remember, this subject will never come up except that a threat of suicide must come up within the first 10 minutes. Guarantee you. Oh, but they're suicidal. I'm suicidal too. Until the society recognizes that I'm better than LeBron James, Tom Brady, and Mike Tyson all at once in their sports. It's like if someone like comes to you and says... Every time I go outside, it feels like everyone's staring at me yeah. and hates me. Mm-hmm. And every time my parents talk to me, I feel like they're talking down to me. Even, mm-hmm. and then, but everyone else can observe that the, everything's normal. Yeah. You take this person and you bring him to a therapist and you say he's depressed. Yeah. You, he needs help. You don't validate his view about everything. Exactly. Or maybe you like you look for reasons why he feels that way and you try to help him. You know. You fix them. Yeah. Yeah. You don't. You don't amplify it mm-hmm. for him. You know? So it's politically correct, incorrect right now. It's like a. You stepped on a mine to say that you need help if you feel something different than the observed reality that we all recognize. But that is the truth, though. I I don't know how else to put it. Yesterday, somebody asked a question about circumcision, and is it true all Muslim men should be circumcised? As a sunnah, yes. How do you respond to people who say, if God exists, why do younger kids die or people get cancer well nobody asked if god exists why was the kid born in the first place right why was he born in the first place because of human behavior if he was born healthy would they say that's god's doing no only when he's born sick they said where's god we say human behavior is what put toxins in the air right human behavior did that where is God coming in the picture? And there's no if God exists. It's, you can just say, like, it's God has, like, wajib wujud. Yeah. You know, like, there's no even if. And we don't, yeah, logically speaking, we don't accept an if because that would negate, uh, we would not have an answer to the question of how we got here today. What do you do when you lose hope? You talk your way out of it. You talk, self-talk. I always tell my kids, it's so important, self-talk. Talk to yourself, okay, with optimistic words and optimistic uh, sayings. And the more you repeat them, they will take, they will settle in your heart. Like, and, and, you'll, and it'll be, start becoming a, like a, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy or a type of um, confirmation bias, right? If you start telling, give yourself confidence, you're going to start seeing that you've done great things. If you give yourself negativity, you will start seeing all the blunders that you make. And you will start getting momentum going downwards. But if self-talk to me is so important, that the, the, the ideas that cross your mind, and it is from Iblis to break you down. Okay, which one? Strangest? All right, Strangest says, um, I heard a scholar say that we only get what we prepare for. Well, that's true in the sense of the verse of Quran, وَأَلَّيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى You only get what you work for. Okay? Does that mean that we need to prepare to receive a dua? Yes, that is correct. If you, you cannot pray for something and not act for it. Okay? Preparing to get married. What if we're afraid of disappointment and pain? You need to overcome that disappointment and pain. That's what faith is. Faith is no is is crossing that barrier, having confidence in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So, if you're a guy who wants to get married, I would start acting 
like you're going to get married tomorrow. Put everything in place. The job, the money, the dowry, save it up. Start acting like you're going to get married tomorrow with the intent that this is husna dhanni billah. This is a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Positive self-talk is a form of husna dhan billah. No doubt about it. DFS says the medical model, I'm assuming she's talking about genders, should never be a substitute for a social model. Chocolate while a question, it was a revelation to me that you said alimony was haram. It is. Why don't our scholars and masjid push for a sunnah-centric mediation process that's legally non-binding but acceptable in divorce? So by the way, you can also make it legally binding if you... And the divorcee and the other divorce, you know, the other party, take the contract drafted with an imam, go to a court and make it legally binding. You can do that. Okay. What is husnavan? It is having a good opinion of Allah. Okay. Dino Palavra, Salatu Tasbih. Do we act upon it? Yes, we do. One day we'll talk about Salat al-Tasbih. Not today, but we will one day. Jay Perez, on, my ch- on, on why children die. We as people can't even recollect ourselves as children, especially our first few years. It's as if Allah has shielded us from pain as children by being unable its, uh, itself in pain. Yes, you can't remember it. You can't. It's a good point. How many salawats should we do to start a habit? 300. Can you see the Prophet while awake? Yes, it is possible. Just, it's essentially seeing a dream while awake. Mukashifa is essentially a dream while awake. Stranger says, I heard that names like Shamsuddin were arrogant names. No, it's okay. It's a good name. It, you're trying, you want your child to be the guide in the religion. That's fine. You can name Sheikh. You can name Imam. You can name these big names because Allah says in the Quran, Make us leaders of the of the faithful, of the pious. So you, we can do that. In what parts of Salah can we raise our hands? In the opening takbir. And for the Shafi's and Hanbalis, every other uh, rukua and rising from rukua. And for the Hanafis and Malikis, nothing else besides the opening takbir. Soul specs, we can't find a deep sense of meaning. We distract ourselves with word games and personal languages. Uh, I think that's what the modern world is all about. I agree with that. Uh, Bin Suleiman, at the end of the day, math aims to encapsulate and describe observed reality. Thank you. That's where the benefit is. Okay? Not the other way around, that we make up a language and then we try to jam reality in it. Slave king, does the heart prostrate? Yes, it does. How does it prostrate? It's a feeling of humility before its Lord. And it has an impact on, this. it reflects on the body, how it speaks, and how quickly it moves in obedience. And how it treats the creation around it. Muhammad Mun'am. Are kids required to start praying and fasting after their first wet dream or period? That, or age 10? No, it's their first wet dream or period, but they should be prepared well before that. They should be praying and fasting well before that. Uh, Anam Lodi says, teachers too are now being forced into teaching things that are blatantly false and they have to make a choice. Are they going to continue in this profession or not? Myra KH. Hey, anybody here, if you have any connections to sisters in Turkey, people who are uh, in Turkey, I have a connection. Myra, did you send me an email? You sent an email to Safina Saadi. I'll send you. I only know of one husband wife in Turkey. So I will send you that information. And, well, maybe others as well. Uh, a couple others that I may know. So I'll try to send you that information. 
what's your opinion on organ donation? The organ is not ours yet. It has been, and it is generally forbidden to, to take the human being as a source of benefit, physically as a source of benefit. But some fatawa have said if someone's going to die, then that haram becomes permitted. Because in general, we are allowed to benefit from animals. We are not allowed to use the human being as a source of benefit. لا به. When is someone considered muttar? You are muttar in your state. Your state is desperate you are desperate and you're weeping okay that is the muttar what is the preferred salawat to get that 300 habits started Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad the first one Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad and then the next one you say Allahumma salli wa sallim alayhi Allahumma salli wa sallim alayhi how simple that is with the pronoun and then you keep doing that it's very short and simple What's the best piece of counsel you've received in Tareem that you're willing to share with us? Um, I wouldn't say it's a counsel. Well, no, actually, the one thing that I had learned in Tareem that I didn't really learn anywhere else is the importance of concern for the Ummah. Um, like the emphasis. Of course, everyone concerns for the Ummah, but they have an emphasis. Part of that emphasis is that they never like to say a single negative word about another Muslim. Like you'll never, you'll very rarely get into gatherings where they're bashing a group. Even that group is misguided. Now maybe, Allah Alam, that one of the functions of that is that they're distant from these groups. They're not living with these groups. Maybe, Allah Alam. But they had such a warm attitude to the Ummah of the Prophet such good opinion of people. You know this is the way of the Prophet when you see it. That's the number one thing to me. Sarah Kay says, I have so many days of missed qada, I have poor health, and I'm struggling to make them up. If you can fast, then you cannot swap it out with fidya. But you can space them out. Isra D says, it's been long, I haven't attended. MashaAllah, keep me in your du'as. May Allah Ta'ala make you happy in this life and in the next. And grant you a qurrat ayn in this life and in the next. Am I taking questions on Instagram? Yes, let's go to Instagram. Are there specific du'as we can ask for better, better adab? Yes, we should say, Allahumma hassan khalqi wa khuluqi. Oh Allah, beautiful. This is the best du'a. What else could you want? Oh Allah, make me handsome and well-mannered. What else could you want from that? This is one of the best du'a. And it derives from the Prophet, Allahumma hassan khuluqi kama hassan ta khalqi. Strangest 14, I heard a scholar say that we only get what we prepare for. We answered this one. Uh, Anam Lodi says, remember that kid called David Reimer who was circumcised as a baby, but the circumcision went wrong. The doctor told the parents to raise him as a girl. And they did. Unbelievable. Jeez. That guy should be sued for every penny he has. If Allah tests one with separating a spouse and shutting all doors, is it okay to confine making dua for those doors to open? It is okay. But I would say, or give me something better than it. Then you're guaranteed something. What is the role of women in family according to Islam? Women are really is essentially the heart of the family and the man is the protector of the family woman the, the in generally in islam the man does the jobs that require that involve danger and aggression and women do the play fulfill the roles and do the jobs that involve compassion and nurturing that's essentially the breakdown. If we're going to make a general breakdown, anytime there's danger and aggression needed, the man should do that. Anytime that there's nurture and compassion, the woman does that, right? How odd would it be to go into a house? I don't care what year we're in. There's a sick baby and there's a thief breaking into the door, right? So the man goes and he takes care of the thief 
while the mother tends to the, to the sick baby. All right, next day comes. A thief and a sick baby. So, right, uh, Mrs. Wife, 50-50, right? So you go and handle the invader. I'll take care of the runny nose of the baby. No. It's like, even in, no matter what year we're in, it's fitrah. It's unacceptable. If a Muslim couple is seeking to get married, Allahu Akbar, what advice do you give in terms of what to sign in a prenup so that we don't have to use the Western legal system if divorce happens? You should say that uh, we will follow, let's say, for example, um, the Hanafi Madhab. Then ask your local imam the book that you're going to follow to. And say, we will follow this book as interpreted to us by this sheikh. That, I've never seen that personally, but i just sent, seen generally that marriage is an according to the Hanafi Madhab. In Egypt, it's very common. That's what they say. Right? Why did they say that? Because in the questions of divorce, custody, that's where we're going to go. In arbitration, we're going to go to the Hanafi Madhab. So that's what I would highly recommend. Can we say, Qasim says, Allahumma salli alayhi, well, you're leaving off the salam. So add the salam. Because the Quran says, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. So Allahumma salli wa sallim alayhi. I am Munib. What's your take? Oh, I don't want to get into that. Uh, yeah, Munib. I don't want to get into that. But we do not, we hold we do hold that imkan al is kufr. Bin Suleiman, Amin. Thank you for your du'a and your words. Is is plastic surgery allowed for someone who has a minor fault in their body, if it would be seen in general? by common Muslims as a, f a defect. Okay? If the common Muslims, anyone looks at you says that's a defect, then yes. But if they say, no, it's not a defect, I just don't like that part of my body, then the answer is no. Like, for example, uh, a nose, shape of a nose, for example. Everyone has uh, something wrong. I got, uh, I didn't tell you one, uh, I don't know if I told everyone here, I did get a septum surgery, life-changing, right? I had broken my nose, which blocks the septum. So the guy says, all right, we're going to go in and fix your nose. I said, so I'm getting, an, I'm going to have a nicer nose? He said, no, no, it doesn't affect the outside of your nose. Your nose will always be crooked. <laughs> he told me straight to my face. He said, your nose is crooked, it's always going to be crooked. I said, khalas, khair. It's only high to dunya. Now, I understand for women, it's more sensitive. In fact, if a guy's too pretty, we get annoyed with him, right? Go rough him up a little bit. Muhammad Muna, if one is in a coma or sedated for a long time, la, if you are passed out, you are not mukallaf for the salah, but you are for siyam. Which is the best way to learn Arabic? Listen to Arabic lectures, read Arabic books, attend Arabic sessions. It's just exposure. That's all it is. Exposure, exposure, exposure. There, I don't think there's one set system. Okay. Madiki Click is here. Assalamu alaikum. We talked about you yesterday. Madiki Click. Those Minnesota Vikings that put up an amazing season. And then, how did they just every year they waste it on their fans? Al Abbas says, My Shi'i family aren't fond of me embracing Sunni Islam. I'm no longer praying with my father. This has caused disharmony at home. Advise. I'll tell you what you may do in terms of Salah. You may, if you have to pray behind your father, you may physically pray behind him and next to him and alongside with him, but your intention is you're praying by yourself. That's something that you may do. What's that? And there are some other issues. You will have to recite the Fatiha, though, out loud. That you can hear yourself. Only that you could hear yourself is enough. Okay, what's the ruling on Ahl al-Kitab? Ahl al-Kitab, in what manner, for example... 
in eating, we may eat their meats if they slaughter. In women, the Muslim man, it's makruh for him to marry Ahlul Kitab, but it's valid. Okay, like that. If they're living amongst Muslims, they would, in the old days, they paid the jizya, which means it, uh, it um, takes their position in the army. They don't have to go to the army. Why, why don't we let Jews and Christians in the army? Because we fight for things that they don't believe in. We fight to, example, one of the fights will be to spread Islam. They don't believe in that. If someone was invading the city, then yes, that's all of our city. They'd all help. But if it was in fight that was expansion, they don't believe in Islam. Why should we ask them to die for something they don't believe in? So they pay the jizya instead. They pay the jizya to be protected. Not Their jizya doesn't go to the expansion because they don't believe in that. How to heal overconfidence or pride as a sickness of the heart. Hang out with people who know better than you, who are richer than you, who are better than you in everything, and they and then you end up being humble. What can you one do if their brother mistreated them and their parents are too quick to forgive him, saying that they can't cut ties with their son, they fear he will turn his back on them if they do. It, it's hard to leave your parents and your son, don't get involved. You don't have to forgive him if you don't want to. But parents and son, there's so much there's so much sensitivity and emotion there that you won't understand until you have your own kids. And that doesn't mean everyone's going to be like that. Some people are tough. Some people are strong. And other people are extremely weak. right? And that may be their um, you know, purification as well. Only two more questions we'll take. Sanatarik says, what to do with the marriage proposal? where the guy prays five times a day. This is recent development in his life. But he has no interest in knowing the deen, not, not, no spiritual spirituality at all, nor likes seeking knowledge. Well, if you do those things, then he cannot be your imam. If you also just started to pray, have no interest in knowledge, and don't care about spirituality, then you can be a fit. But if you have those interests and he doesn't, he cannot be your imam. Remember, husband's job is to be imam as well in the house. He's the imam of your deen. Assalamu alaikum, says Aisha Davies. So to be clear, are you saying that a defect that bothers a person to the point of self-loathing would be okay to have cosmetic surgery on? No, I think the best parameter is to say that the people, the Muslim people, the regular praying five times a day uh, Muslims, would all agree, in other words, like your family is enough, really. Your family, your extended family, your friends, your grandma. If they would come to a concurrence that this is a defect, it's a birth, it's a birth defect, right? You can alter it. Like what? Crooked teeth. I think all societies, yeah, that's a fix them, braces. Can't see properly. Get glasses. Okay. Maybe the there's something like um, a mole or something. Right? You can remove it. Right? Things like that, that in general the society all recognizes. By the society, I mean the people around you. It would be recognized in society as a defect. Now, where is that line? There's going to be a line that we all agree on. There's going to be a line that we all agree is not. There's probably going to be a little bit of a middle. Right? And that's your judgment call. So I hope that's that makes it clear. Yeah, uh, so that that's how I would look at it. Like for example, a cleft lip. Yes, cleft lip, one hundred percent. We alhamdulillah we have surgery for this now. Things like that. Maz says, "How do you bring friend who is into sins close to the dean? Just hang out with him. Make him hang out with you. You don't go hang out with his group." Make him come and hang out with your group. Ladies and gentlemen, today is the day for Maliki Fiqh. Okay? And that class is at 7 o'clock. Maliki Fiqh today is at 7 o'clock. Sign up to ArcView Basic. Okay? We will be getting um, really serious about building up ArcView. Very slowly, but we're getting there. Jazakumullah khair on everyone. We will close out with this. I pray that Allah Ta'ala gives everybody here strong iman.
and gives everybody happiness in Islam and makes everyone feel grateful that we have this great deen and this great prophet and these mashayikh who have transmitted the deen to us and makes us all feel that great amount of appreciation that motivates us to keep going and to spread this to our friends and to our families and to everybody else. Jazakum Allahu khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Wal asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Thank you.